guest. We've talked a little bit about him already. He is uh, also a um, very avid amateur astronomer and author, and uh, he gave me this cheat sheet to use. I thank him for that. Um, his real job, actually, uh, he works at Brookhaven National Laboratory, where he supervises development and implementation of training courses for employees. And by night, he's an instructor at uh, Dowling College in Oakdale, New York, where he teaches courses in stellar and planetary astronomy. He's also an author. He's written a number of books, including, I can't hold them and talk at the same time, but uh, Star Watch and also Star Wear. And these are two of seven total books, if I'm correct. He's working on another one, which I think will be a sequel to this one. Am I correct? Uh, fourth edition. Fourth edition. Yeah, this is the third edition, uh, which talks about uh, all sorts of telescopes that are out there. And that will kind of mirror his speech, speech tonight, which will more or less cover the gamut of uh, telescopes from A to Z, as well as observing techniques. Uh, Phil is a contributing editor, writer for Astronomy Magazine in his uh, spare time when he has it. So let's give a big Novak welcome to Phil Harrington. Well, thank you very much. I uh, want to thank Mike and Rob and the organization for asking me here. I'm truly honored to speak to you this evening. Uh, my daughter Helen has come down with me. We spent yesterday touring around Washington, D.C. She being a, a history major in college, uh, that was her day. Uh, this is my day here. She's tolerating, uh, tolerating the astronomy stuff, and then tomorrow we go back to history uh, on our way home. But uh, again, thank you very much for, for inviting me here. Um, this evening, I'd, I'd like to, and the topic of the uh, title of the talk, Telescope Basic Training, I'd like to address just that. How to use a telescope, how to tell a good telescope from a bad telescope from an ugly telescope. Not that we have any bad or ugly telescopes out here in the field. I'm confident of that. But in case we might happen to have had one snuck in when no one was looking, here are some ways that we can maybe uh, uh, flush them out uh, either right now or maybe later on later on this evening. So how to judge the good, the bad, from the ugly. And I would like to ask right, right off the top, um, how many of you own telescopes? Let's start with that. Okay, good, the vast majority of you. How many of you don't own a telescope? For those who have your hands up, how many of you are thinking, no, well, maybe I will buy a telescope at least one of these days? How many of you are seriously considering buying and you may be making the decision imminently? The talk is for you. Everybody else, you can eavesdrop for the moment uh, because I'm going to at least the first part of the presentation, I'd like to address it to those people who are considering purchasing a telescope. If you're thinking of buying a telescope, my first word of advice is to stop. Don't do anything just yet. There are good telescopes to be had, there are bad telescopes to be had, and there are ugly telescopes to have. And right now, they all may look good to you, they all may look bad to you, but we'll try to again identify one from the next. Now, Rod certainly has an affiliation with schmidt cassegrain telescopes. I'm going to paint a, a somewhat broader picture. I will try to stay as apolitical as possible, although I do have my own personal favorites, and we could chat about them. Uh, by the way, Rod, I want to thank him for only charging $10 for a correct answer. I'm from New York, however, and higher taxes and, and so forth. I'm afraid to say my rate is $20. Uh, a correct answer, wrong answers are $10. Correct answers are 20 but we'll get to that uh, as we go. In any case, astronomy can be a lifelong love. I've been an amateur astronomer since 1968, when at the tender age of 12, uh, I was assigned by my sixth grade science teacher to look at an eclipse of the moon that took place Good Friday that April 1968, and wouldn't you know we had a day off, being Good Friday, but we had to have a three-day weekend, and he gave us homework. That's terrible. But, you know, I, I thought, well, as a 12-year-old, what are the odds that it's going to be clear? Right? Well, unfortunately, it was clear that night, and we had to take a look at the lunar eclipse, and something that night sparked in me, a, a love for astronomy spark that continues to burn inside of me today. I'm fortunate that astronomy has developed into a lifelong love. I became involved with a, a junior astronomy club in Connecticut where I was born and raised, and that also continued to foster my love for astronomy until we, we find ourselves having this conversation today. Unfortunately, there were many very good friends of mine back in those days who, for them, astronomy did not develop into a lifelong love. They came, they went, and moved on to other things. For them, it proved to be frustrating, disappointing, and expensive either for themselves or for their parents, largely because of the telescopes that they purchased. 
Uh, admittedly, many of us, myself included, began our study of the universe with these TASCO telescopes that we uh, heard about uh, in the last hour. Uh, again, they pointed, disappointed many of us. Uh, many of us turned off completely. In any case, how could you avoid experiencing that same sense of disappointment if you're purchasing that first telescope? To find out, let's do so by way of a brief history lesson. Let's trace where we have come up to the point where we are today. Uh, the whole idea of a telescope began in 1608 or so, history tells us, when Hans Lippershey, a spectacle maker in the Netherlands, uh, held up two lenses in line, so the story goes. Uh, actually, the exact origin of the telescope is a bit lost in history. Some say his children did it. Others say that it was actually uh, thought of years before Lippershey came along. But in any case, Lippershey is generally credited as coming up with the first telescope. Voila, there it is. He did not, however, recognize the scientific significance of his accidental discovery, uh, instead aiming his telescopes more toward military applications. A year later, though, over in Italy, our friend Galileo Galilei, independently, having heard of Lippershey's invention, independently devised a telescope based on Lippershey's original concept. Of course, Galileo, although he didn't invent the telescope, is certainly credited with being the first to recognize the scientific application by discovering things like moons around Jupiter and craters on the moon and, and uh, while well, the list goes on and on, of course. Galileo's telescope, Lippershey's telescope, are referred to as refractors simply because of the fact that there is an objective lens in the front. The objective lens, as light passes through it, bends or refracts that light down to a focus point. Now, Lippershey's and Galileo's telescopes are, are a bit different than the modern day refractors that we see out in the field uh, this evening. Uh, instead, the modern day refractor actually can be traced back to Johann Kepler. Two years after Galileo, Kepler had a better idea. And I won't go into any of the, the sort of details, but he slightly tweaked the lens design down toward the eyepiece, which is the business end of the telescope that you look through. And doing so, he improved both the optical quality, the field of view, or that is the, the uh, uh, the apparent size of the image that you're looking at, the, the um, uh, diameter of the image, I should say, damage or diameter of the field, and came up with a much better design. Still, though, the Keplerian refractor was still fraught with optical problems, one of which was that every time you looked at an object through one of those telescopes, you saw it surrounded by a bright ring of color, referred to as chromatic aberration. Um, that a problem really wasn't addressed successfully until the year 1758 when a gentleman named John Dolland uh, created what is referred to as an achromatic refractor. Instead of having a single lens element for the objective lens, Dolland discovered that if he matched a second optical element or a second lens behind the, uh, the um, objective lens in front, creating a, a two-element objective lens in the process, that this chromatic aberration was greatly dampened down. Uh, in fact, the word achromatic means without color. Well, it was a bit of a misnomer, unfortunately, because achromatic refractors, although better than the simple refractors of Lippershey, Galileo, and, and Kepler, still had some false color around. So referring to them as without color, achromatic, is a, a bit of a misnomer. Ernst Abbey, working for Carl Zeiss in Germany, uh, in 1879, came up with what we refer to as an apochromatic refractor. Now, if the word achromatic means without color, the word apochromatic means really without color this time, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> because Abby, by again playing with the optical design, putting in a third lens element, doing some other tweaking, was able to greatly suppress the false colors that Dolan had begun work with 100 and 41 or so, 121 years later, uh, earlier rather. So the cream of the crop, even to this day, when we are talking about refractors, again with lenses in the front, what most people think of as a telescope when they, when they uh, imagine one in their minds, um, the best of the best today can trace back to Abby's original design in 1879. Meantime, though, another design began to uh, see life in 1663 when James Gregory, 
decided that there was more than one way to skin a cat. A lens, of course, is required in an achromatic refractor to bend the light and bring it down to a focus point right over here, point referred to as the prime focus. Uh, Gregory realized that if he used a mirror, now not just a flat mirror, not just a bathroom mirror, not one that he was shaving with that morning, but rather a very specialized mirror that is curved, concave, somewhat bowl-shaped, if light were to bounce off that mirror, it too would eventually draw to a focus point. It's called a reflecting telescope simply because the light is reflecting now to a focus point as opposed to a refractor where it refracts or bends to a focus. Now the first reflecting telescope, the Gregorian reflector as it's called, really is, is of no interest these days except to uh, telescope historians and, and so forth. Rather, the following decade, 1672, Sir Isaac Newton he was the one who, of course, was concerned with apples falling on his head, discovering gravity and all that sort of thing. Also came up with a new reflector design that bears his name, the Newtonian reflector. And certainly we look outside, I have, looked, have to look no farther than that gentleman over there studying the star map with the large, white, sort of short, squat, fat tube. How you doing? Just talking about your telescope. It's okay. <laughs> We see Newtonian reflectors all over the place. Very, very popular telescopes. They all trace back to our friend Sir Isaac in 1672. That very same year, across the English Channel, a French optician named Cassegrain, and I can't pronounce his first name, S-I-E-U-R. Anyone know how to pronounce that? Sire? Could be Sire. I'll take that. I'm easy to please. Could be Sire. In any case, Mr. Cassegrain, I'll call him. Uh, came up with another design for a reflecting telescope where he uses, well, let me go back first to Newtonian. Primary mirror. A second mirror has to divert the light out the front side of the tube, which is where you put the eyepiece, the lens that you look through. Now, in the case of the Cassegrain reflector, instead of having what's referred to as a diagonal mirror tilted at a 45 degree angle to bend the light outside of the telescope in the front, instead, this telescope mirror is convex shaped, bows outward a little bit, and the light comes down to a focus, passes through a hole in the middle of the primary mirror, and out the rear end. Uh, Rod was talking about schmidt cassegrain telescope, similar design structure. Uh, optically different, but a similar design structure. That was 1672. The original Newtonian reflector, though, suffered from a lot of optical problems, not the least of which is nobody knew how to make an effective glass mirror back then. Instead, the mirrors were made out of a metal named speculum, which had a, a uh, terrible problem with tarnishing. Not until 1722 did John Hadley come up with a parabolic Newtonian mirror, greatly improved the, uh, the image, and then years later on, the first glass mirror was incorporated into the Newtonian reflector, effectively creating the telescope that we know today. The third type of telescope instrument popular among amateur astronomers today combine attributes of the refractor with the reflector and is referred to as a catadioptric. That was Rod's $5 word, or in my case, because I'm from New York, it's a $10 word. But in any case, a catadioptric was first devised by Bernard Schmidt over in Germany in 1930. His original design, though, was uh, primarily that of a photographic instrument, but it was later adapted over for visual use. First in 1941 by an optician named Bowers and the same year Dmitry Meksudov. The telescope bears Meksudov's name today when we talk about a Meksudov telescope. It technically should be called a Bowers telescope, but Meksudov over here uh, had a little, little, I guess a little more prominent role in, the, in its final development, and so it actually carries his name. At the same time, Rod's beloved schmidt cassegrain telescope came about some years later in the, in the 20th century. The exact year of its creation is a bit lost to history. However, as he mentioned, Tom Johnson, uh, the uh, founder of Celestron, is really credited with the first person to uh, create a practical, and that's him in the, the picture over there on the far right. Uh, the first person really credited with creating the first practical commercial schmidt cassegrain telescope. So that came about in 1963.
Sounds like a lot of technical babble or telebabble to a lot of people probably. What, what's talking about these different types of telescopes? Regardless of the design of telescope, all telescopes, all the telescopes out there in the field share some common terminology. These four terms, for instance. When we talk about the size of a telescope, we are not talking about the physical length of the tube, but instead we are talking about its aperture. The aperture, quite simply, is the diameter of the prime optic. In the case of a refracting telescope, it's the diameter of the objective lens. In the case of a reflecting telescope, it is the diameter of the primary mirror sitting down to the bottom end of the telescope tube. The physical length of the telescope is referred to as its focal length. The distance from that prime optic, and again I'm using a refractor as an example, to the prime focus point. The eyepiece that you look through is placed behind that prime focus point. And this physical length can be measured in inches or millimeters or centimeters or pick a unit of, of your choice. The focal ratio, you'll often take a look at telescope uh, literature and you will see a telescope with an F number, F with a slash next to it. Uh, that number is the telescope's focal ratio, which is no more than the focal length of the telescope divided by the aperture of the telescope. Simply a ratio, as, as the word, as the phrase says. Lastly, magnification or power of the telescope is another ratio, actually. It's the focal length of the telescope divided by the focal length of the eyepiece or the eye lens that you have in the instrument at the time. Of course, I can make any telescope uh, uh, run at a different magnification by changing either the focal length of the eyepiece or the focal length of the telescope itself. It's a whole lot easier to change the focal length of the eyepiece, just pop one out and put another one in. And that brings up an interesting point. Most people who are thinking of purchasing a telescope, to them the most important point to consider is the power or the magnification of the telescope, right? It's got to be. Take a look at the literature. Such as this fine instrument over here, who shall remain nameless, the manufacturer, but I circle down over here, it's got to be important because what's the first thing in the long list of confusing terminology? Magnification. 675 power. Jeez, that's a big number. It's got to be a good telescope, right? Well, no, not actually. It isn't because, again, I can take any telescope and make it run at any magnification just by popping out one eyepiece and putting another eyepiece in. Do I want to do that? No. No, not at all. There are other much more important points to consider, and we'll talk about a few of them in, uh, in the next couple of slides. I always tell those who are considering purchasing either a first telescope, a second telescope, or a tenth telescope, to consider what I, what I refer to as the telescope trifecta. You know, if you go to horse racing or, or uh, 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 the racetrack, talk about the trifecta, right? Win, place, show. Well, I, I refer to the telescope trifecta as watch, place, and dough. Let's talk about watch. What do you want to see with a telescope? What do you want to do with it? Depending on how you answer that question, that's going to greatly influence your choice. Place. Where are you going to use that telescope? And as importantly, where are you going to keep it when it is not in use? And then lastly, of course, the almighty dollar. How much money can you afford to spend? Many people will, will email me. I, I, I can't tell you how often I get email, uh, emails from people. They say, I have, I'm have i brand new. I just got interested in astronomy three weeks ago. I have $5,000 to spend. What should I buy? I, of course, tell them to buy my book. <laughs> and I just spent their first $20. More importantly, though, I will ask them what do they want to do with the telescope. Because different designs work better for different purposes. If you are interested in looking at deep sky objects, star clusters, galaxies, nebulas, and the like, aperture rules. Aperture always wins. Size does count, no matter what they tell you when it comes to deep sky observing. If I'm interested, though, in looking at lunar and planetary, the moon itself, Saturn, <laughs> Jupiter, and so forth, aperture still wins. But high-quality aperture is an absolute requirement. Not to say that high-quality isn't required over here, but most deep sky objects are, what, little faint fuzzy things? And they're going to look a little faint and fuzzy if I look at them with a high-quality set of optics or 
a mediocre set of optics. They're still going to look kind of fuzzy. And we could debate that. But by and large, that's probably true. Oh, and lastly, <laughs> photography. I read a, a study once that said that something like 80% of those who are new to astronomy, one of the first things they want to do is astrophotography. Commendable. Ridiculous, but commendable. <laughs> because even though 80% of the people want to do that, I would guess that less than 20% ever do it successfully, right? I don't do it successfully. I've never, never claimed to. I've tried, sure. Long before the day of digital photography, I can't tell you how much money I wasted on film. I mean, I had rolls of high-speed ectochrome back in the 70s that just, you know, no, look at that, 36 pictures, and they're all underexposed <laughs> in the garbage can, or the tracking wasn't right, or the other, you know, right? Uh, it's just terrible. Anyway, but if you want to get into photography, certainly versatility and accessories are important as well. So things you have to consider. How about place? Where will you be using the telescope? Can you use it at home? Or are you going to have to travel with it? Uh, I dare say that the cartoon over here on the right, that's probably not the right kind of telescope for that family traveling with it. Right? So you have to choose your telescope to match your car. Or is it the other way around? <laughs> i got to tell you a quick story. Um, back in the 19, oh, I guess the late 80s or so, a good friend of mine up in Connecticut, an electrical engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer by schooling, and so, you know, electrical engineers, we can't expect too much from. <laughs> but in any case, any electrical engineers in the crowd, by the way? Yeah. Oh, okay, I, you have my sympathies. Uh, in any case, but then again, are you still employed as an engineer? Yeah. Okay, I'm not. So, you know, what do I know? <laughs> anyway, an uh, electrical engineer, he bought a, an 18-inch Newtonian reflector. Stood taller than I do, weighs more than I do. He orders it cost him $10,000. He took delivery of it, and then he realized, I live in an apartment in Bridgeport, Connecticut, <laughs> and, true story, and I drive a Nissan 300ZX. <laughs> Absolute true story. He then went out and realized his dilemma after he got delivery of the telescope, and he bought a $25,000 Toyota minivan, <laughs> which he still has today. So therefore, that telescope cost him $35,000. <laughs> Consider your car. Or again, is it the other way around? Where are you going to store the telescope? Equally important. He lives in an apartment, an upstairs apartment in Bridgeport, Connecticut. His telescope lives in the back of his minivan, 365 days a year. And that's just fine, I suppose. But where will you be storing it? In your car? In a garage? In your dining room? Your living room? Bedroom? Whatever the case may be. Will you be carrying it upstairs? Uh, I always recommend, if possible, to store it outside, properly sealed against the elements and dust and, and uh, so forth. Uh, maybe in a shed or possibly in an observatory. I built an observatory. Uh, I've, I've had a dream of building an observatory, having my own observatory, since 1968. Uh, May of 68. The, month after that eclipse when I bought my first astronomy book called The Sky Observer's Guide. Anybody ever see that? Little, little golden nature guide, great little book. Anyway, in there I opened it up and I saw a number of different observatories. I thought, oh, to have died and gone to heaven with your own observatory. Well, it took me a little while, but I finally built my own observatory uh, last year. And this is my 18-inch reflector. Uh, I refer to this as a roll-away observatory because actually the shelter that covers the telescope during the day rolls away on a set of four wheels along these two wooden tracks uh, exposing the telescope. So it works really well. I didn't want to build a, a fancy observatory because, quite honestly, uh, I, I am to carpentry what Norm Abram is to brain surgery. Uh, that is not very well known. So uh, therefore, I had to come up with a design that I would do the least amount of damage, and this works just fine for me. Uh, but you do have to ask yourself, where are you going to store it? And then lastly, what about dough? What's your budget? You don't want to cheap out because a good telescope will last you a lifetime. Uh, I uh, was fortunate enough to get an 8-inch Newtonian reflector uh, for my Christmas gift in 1971 from my parents. And although both of my parents are, are now gone, that telescope is still with me. And I've told my wife that that telescope gets buried with me. You know, <laughs> we'll just get a bigger coffin dump us both in, it will be just fine. But at the same time, you don't want to blow your entire investment, your entire budget on a telescope because there are other things to consider, of course. Uh, things like eyepieces. 
the eyepieces that come with telescopes typically are rather mediocre in quality, and so you probably want to boost up that collection a little bit as your interest and as your expertise and your budget permits. You might want to consider some filters, either narrow band or broad band uh, filters to help combat light pollution a little bit. Uh, other color filters maybe for the planets or the moon. You certainly have to pick up a good star atlas. You can't get here from there without a good map, without a star atlas. Star atlas is absolutely uh, a requirement. And then, of course, an observing guide or two. And that's just a subliminal suggestion I give you. That's my book, Star Watch, up there. <laughs> Copies of which will be available at a discount after the presentation. And I will mention it again, at least not on this slide. <laughs> and then, of course, the telescope, that is the optical tube itself, is only half the equation. What are you going to do about a telescope mount? There are three basic types of telescope mounts out there. There are altitude, well, I should say there are two. There are altitude azimuth mounts that come in three flavors. We'll talk about them in a second. And then there are equatorial mounts that come in two general designs, at least in the amateur market. We could talk about them as well. However, which type of mount is appropriate for you depends on how you answer those three questions in the trifecta. Watch, place, and dough. Altitude azimuth mounts, like I say, come in three varieties these days. Simple alt azimuth mounts, typically seen nowadays over at Walmart, Kmart, maybe the more upscale ones are in Target, uh, and so forth. Uh, there are Dobsonian mounts, such as we see over here, very basic design, sitting low squat to the ground. There are a number of them out. I, I would encourage you, if you are considering a telescope, take a look at those that are out in the field. There are some very good ones that I saw out there before. There are a couple that I might pass on. I'm not going to point fingers. And then there are go-to mounts. Really is a fork mount, but not tilted at an angle matching your, your latitude. Uh, referred to as a go-to mount because, as Rod was saying, this gentleman with the nice sweater over there, he punches in a couple of numbers, and the telescope, in theory at least, goes to what it's supposed to be going to. I say in theory because, again, there's a little asterisk there. Uh, and the, the asterisk indicates a footnote that says, not always. But uh, for the most part, they, they work pretty well. Then there are equatorial mounts, a German equatorial mount, and a fork-style equatorial mount. Uh, these are designed to be tilted, to tilt the telescope at the angle, the entire telescope mount, I should say, at the angle matching your latitude. And then by turning on a motor on the, the drive axis over here, the telescope will track the sky automatically. Likewise, a fork mount, same basic design. You don't see fork mounts, per se, uh, used in amateur astronomy that much anymore. Uh, I should say, you, you don't see them tilted at the angle. These are the common style used with, with the larger go-to type telescopes uh, in the previous slide. Uh, but again, this equatorial wedge, as it's called, required for photography, but nowadays not required for visual observation. Let's get to the bottom line for those who are considering a telescope, because again, dough is often the considering factor. So I've sorted telescopes based on their style, beginning with refractors. General price range, and I'm not giving exact dollar values, but one dollar symbol versus two versus three gives you some relative idea of what we're talking about here. And what they're best at, lunar and planetary observing, deep sky observing, and photography, either one lunar and planetary or two deep sky. And you can just sort of look at this and absorb it very briefly. The smallest refracting telescopes are certainly the least expensive instruments that are around nowadays. Uh, they are fine for lunar, adequate for planetary viewing, but rather limited for deep sky viewing, primarily because of their aperture. And as far as photography, it might be possible to take pictures of the moon, but really not for anything beyond that. Uh, larger achromatic refractors, a little more money. Recommended certainly for lunar, lunar and planetary observing, although still chromatic aberration, false color, these colorful little purplish and yellow glows around the planets uh, that aren't really supposed to be there uh, can be a problem. They're not bad for brighter deep sky objects, and depending on the kind of, kind of mounting, they're, they're adequate for some forms of uh, photography. Moving up in the price scale, let's look at a pot chromatic refractor, as I just abbreviated abbreviate them APO because I didn't want my word wrapping to get all messed up. Um, a smaller apochromatic refractor is 70 millimeter, 2.8 inch to a 4 inch or so. Well, prices are approachable nowadays, depends on the manufacturer, depends on the accoutrements, the accessories that come along with it. 
Outstanding for lunar observing. A little small still for looking for fine details on the planets. Again, rather limited also for deep sky observing. Good for lunar, fair for planetary photography, but very good for wide field deep sky photography, again, depending on the planet. Larger apochromatic refractors. Highly recommend for lunar planetary. Expensive though. Good for bright deep sky objects, planetary nebula star clusters and the like. And again, also highly recommended for photography of all sorts, depending again on the kind of mounting that you're having. However, if you want to get into any of photography, you're going to be spending big bucks to be able to do that. Now, as far as reflecting telescopes, these are Newtonian reflectors. Um, somewhere between a 4.5 inch and an 8 inch Newtonian reflector on equatorial mount. Reasonably priced. Not bad for lunar or planetary. Not bad for deep sky, at least of the brighter objects. Photography, again, possible, especially of the moon, depending on the kind of mounting. And as we go up in size, a 10 inch or larger on an equatorial mount, big bucks. Fine for um, uh, planetary, the moon though, uh, because of the large aperture now, 10 inches larger, the moon's uh, brightness can be rather overpowering. Uh, deep sky observing, they're great at, and also very good for photography, again, depending on the quality of that mounting. And then lastly, down here, 10 inches larger, on Dobsonian style mounts, very simple altitude azimuth, left to right, up and down mo motions. Fine again for the planetary, moon once again overpowering because of, of its brightness. Highly re recommended for deep sky observing. Not really recommended for planetary, again because the mounting is so basic, there's no tracking and so forth, and therefore it's not, they're not terribly suitable for photography. It's not to say that it's impossible of the moon, at least with webcams, but it's not recommended for really anything else. Then lastly, catadioptric telescopes. Three and a half inch to eight inch, Miksudov. Remember our friend Miksudov back in 1941? Can be pricey, but very good for lunar and planetary. Very good for brighter deep sky objects, although at least a six inch aperture is preferred. Very good for photography of the moon and the planets. Not so great for planetary photography. They have a very uh, uh, slow F ratios, it's called that F number is rather high, and as a result, they require a, a relatively long exposure uh, with a camera, digital or film, doesn't really matter. Um, for Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes, a five inch to a nine and a quarter inch, rather, uh, uh, well, mid range price, I'll, I'll call it. Certainly recommended, especially the C nine and a quarter. Rod mentioned he singled that all, out also, although he said the 11 inch. Uh, um, Celestron is also very good, which it is, but I, I personally feel that the nine and a quarter inch Celestron is probably about the be best schmidt cassegrain telescope in, in uh, production today. Uh, very good for deep sky observing, at least an eight inch aperture. Again, I knocked it down to a five inch over here just for the price range, but eight inch or, or larger is required for deep sky. And good for photography, especially with larger apertures. Then lastly, 10 inch and larger schmidt cassegrain telescopes would be the uh, Celestron 11, the Mead 10, 12, 14, and 16 inch uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope. Big bucks. Good for observing the moon and the planets, although again the moon can be rather overpowering and so bright. Recommended for deep sky observing and also for photography. So depending on what your interests are, um, there are some possible choices for your perfect telescope. Bearing in mind, of course, there is no such thing as a single per perfect telescope for everybody. Well, now everybody else can come back into the talk because we've talked about the first telescope or maybe the second telescope, but if, what if you already have a telescope? Is it any good? You know, that's the constant debate. Is my telescope good or is it fair? You ask almost anybody and they'll say, oh, my telescope is great. Well, there, there are some lemons out there also, and the question is, how do you know? Uh, we have to take a critical look at the images of our telescope. How good is what we are seeing? Uh, are they plagued with different aberrations, as the word is. Uh, spherical aberration is caused by a less than perfect optic, could be a lens, could be a mirror, that causes the light to focus not at an, ex at an exact point, but rather at slightly different distances depending on where the light is hitting or striking the optic. So the focus point can, instead of being an exact point all the way along, can actually move back and forth, causing the image to appear very fuzzy. We can have what's called coma. Coma causes stars toward the edge of the field to look like little comets. And we have chromatic aberration, again the problem where we have this nice purplish or yellowish haze surrounding especially brighter objects. 
a problem associated with refractors, but not reflectors, uh, just the, the optical properties of, of the, uh, the instrument, whereas spherical aberration and coma can certainly plague all types of telescopes, regardless of the optical design. Well, some of these are certainly visible just by looking at the image that the telescope is producing. Others, though, require some rather, I don't want to say sophisticated, but specialized testing, something called the star test. Unfortunately, to test our telescopes, the vast majority of us don't have optical laboratories where we can set the optics up on a nice test bench and run this, this long gambit of tests. We have only our two God-given eyes, the nighttime sky, and not a whole lot else. But even with just that most basic equipment, we can run something called the star test conducted right at the telescope outside at night, which is as telling as any optical shop test. You just have to know what to look for. Uh, lenses, objective lenses, the vast majority do not, however. A Newtonian reflector, adjusting the uh, optical collimation is a, a four-step process. With a schmidt cassegrain it's actually a one-step process because you can only adjust the aim of the, the second smaller mirror and the secondary mirror, uh, rather than the larger primary mirror is fixed in place in the vast majority of, of cases. Um, can't really go into a lot of detail, but I'll tell you right now that most of the telescopes that I have tested, and I do quite a bit of testing for Astronomy Magazine as well as just for my own interest, um, many telescopes that people say to me, geez, these optics are really terrible. The optics are certainly good, they're just out of collimation. So it's absolutely critical that you check the collimation of your telescope. How do you do it? Well, my book Starware has some instructions, but another shameless plug. More subliminal suggestions. Um, to, to adjust the um, the alignment or the collimation of a Newtonian reflector, though, it's absolutely critical that you put a reference spot right in the center of your primary mirror. To do that, you have to cut out first a paper mask matching the diameter of your telescope mirror. Take the mirror out of the telescope. Cut a paper mask, the diameter of your telescope mirror. If your telescope doesn't have a center spot already, of course, many of them do. Fold that mask in half, fold it in half again, and then cut off the little corner. Open it up, and you'll have a hole in the very center of that mask. Lay it over very carefully over the primary mirror itself with a very fine point indelible ink pen. Put a mark on that very center, and then lay one of these little reinforcing labels that you pick up over at Staples or Office Max or some such, and uh, lay it on the center of the primary mirror, and all of a sudden you have a nice little center reference spot. Because most collimation instructions will tell you to uh, uh, reference that center point. And without, it, without a reference point there, it's kind of tough to, to go beyond. Once you get the, t uh, the optics all in collimation, all the other conditions are met. You run the star test by centering a star in the field of view, slowly changing the focus of the telescope, not too much, just a little bit, depending on the focal ratio of the telescope. And then take a look at what you are seeing. Take a look at the resulting star images. The stars will expand out from a point to a series of rings. Depending on what you see, you can identify the type of optical problem your telescope is experiencing. Unless you see identical images either side of focus, like down here in the lower right, you have one of these optical problems. For instance here, astigmatism. Notice how the image is slightly oval, slightly oval, but they are perpendicular to each other tells you you have what's referred to as astigmatism. Uh, you have coma if the star itself has a, a bright side, and again, it's, it's rather off-center, you can see. Spherical aberration, common problem with, with, the most common optical problem with telescopes nowadays. The images, again, notice how you have the brightest point toward the center. Here in the center on the other side of focus, though, it's rather, rather dark. A turned down edge, you have a fuzzy out-of-focus view on one side, but sharp on the other. Zones, you have a bright outer ring, here's a little bit dimmer, tells you you have a uh, sort of a, an uneven bump in the telescope, telescope mirror in this case, looking at a, a Newtonian re reflector for all these examples. And then perfect optics, identical images on either side of the focus star. If that's what you're seeing, identical images, you have a peach of a telescope. If you're seeing something less than identical images, then you have something less, something less than a peach. Hope it's not a pit. Um, with an unobstructed telescope, a refractor, again, you're going to see some optical problems as well. Astigmatism, notice the different colors. Chromatic aberration again. 
Um, here we have uh, an inner zone, never mind that little horseshoe shape out of here, that was just an obstruction in the, in the telescope, but not part of the, part of the results. But we can see a difference over here in the two star images indicating, in this case, we have what's referred to as a zone, a, a, a less than perfect section of the lens. Not the entire lens, but just a, a section or a zone of the lens is uh, not quite what it ought to be, causing the stars to, to not focus quite as sharply as they ought to. At the same time, you can pick up what's referred to as a Ronke tester, which is a, an eyepiece, actually a lensless eyepiece. It has instead a, a, what's referred to as a defract, diffraction grating, a piece of acetate plastic with very finely etched lines. You put this into your telescope in place of your regular eyepiece, aim it at a star, doesn't matter which star in this case, throw it out of focus, and you see a series of black lines. If the black lines are as they appear in the upper left-hand corner, perfect optics, perfectly straight, vertical, alternating black and white lines. If, however, you see this view, in the upper right, how they're skewed at an angle relative to each other, your telescope is suffering from astigmatism, not your eyes, but your telescope. A zone, a less than perfect area of the lens or mirror will show a little bump, like so. Spherical aberration, instead of having perfectly straight lines, as we see here in the upper left, notice how they bow outwards and bow inwards on the other side. And then lastly, a turned edge, meaning that the edge in this case, here we have a, a portion in the center of the lens or mirror not perfect. Out here we have the edge of the lens or mirror not perfect. Straight lines until it gets to the edge and then they hook in or hook out, depending on which side of focus you are looking at. So that's referred to as the Ronke test. Uh, the Ronke test is not as accurate as the star test. Uh, some people find it a little bit easier to do, certainly. And uh, at this point also, I'd like to uh, invite anybody, if you're interested in having me take a look, and I don't profess to be an expert at star test by any means, but I have looked through a couple of telescopes in my day. If you'd like me to take a look through yours uh, afterwards as it gets dark, I certainly would be happy to. The optics are only part of the, uh, the uh, uh, judgment process, however. What about mechanically? If you're considering purchasing a telescope, check the focuser. How smoothly does it work? A lot of telescopes imported from the char as far east use a grease to lubricate their focusers that really seem to be more like glue by the time they get through uh, immigration and so forth. Uh, I recommend that you clean that off with a degreaser and re-lube with a dry Teflon spray such as you'll find at your local bike shop. Work very, very well and make a very sticky fine, uh, focuser work very smoothly. Take a look at the telescope mount. Do they, does the mount move smoothly or is it sticky? <laughs> How about vibrations? I always test the telescope, telescope mount by doing what I call the wrap test. Take the open palm of my hand, the heel of my hand, and I wrap <laughs> the telescope mount just with my hand like... Let's see if I can get it to work. Eh, it didn't work. Okay. Anyway, I wrap it with the, the, uh, my hand and I time the, time, uh, time the uh, vibrations. <laughs> if the vibrations dampen out anywhere from zero to two seconds, it's a great telescope mount. Three to five seconds, it's not bad. Five to ten seconds, fair. Anything less than ten seconds, we call that, that's a special type of telescope mount, it's called a tuning fork mount. It just keeps on going and going and going. More often than not, the telescope mount is not the problem, but the tripod, the spindly little aluminum legs that the telescope is sitting on, actually are the problem. I mentioned I get a lot of email from people. One question that seems to come up periodically is, you say, you know, Phil, I just um, uh, bought a new telescope, have it outside, ha had it now for maybe five, six months. Should I clean the telescope? And the answer is absolutely not. And then they insist, they say, but when I shine a flashlight onto my mirror, it looks dirty. What should I do? You know what I tell them to do? I tell them don't do that anymore. <laughs> just stop. They're looking for trouble. I can't tell you how often I get people sending me that email that a month or so later said, well, I didn't follow your advice, and now I have a cracked lens, or I have a damaged mirror. Because more often than not, you will do more damage than good by trying to clean your telescope. So never clean an optical surface if it appears dusty. Keep it capped. 
keep the caps on, the covers on. There's no reason for an optical surface to appear dusty if it's properly stored. However, especially, this is especially true with eyepieces, they can get grimy or oily simply from grease from your eyelashes uh, and so forth. How do you clean those? A couple of different ways. Uh, I say clean the surface using compressed air or camel's hair brush first. You want to get the big rocks off the eyepieces, so you sweep them off very gently. And then either use the lens cleaning fluid you uh, purchase from a trusted company or make your own. My home brew solution, three quarts distilled water, one quart pure isopropyl alcohol, and a few drops of ivory liquid, and it will last you a lifetime. Uh, or you can use what's called a lens pen, which is kind of a neat little device, which uh, seems to work quite well uh, also. As far as mirrors and filters, do not use lens cleaning fluid on either because it's not called mirror or filter cleaning fluid, it's called lens cleaning fluid, and it doesn't work right with mirrors or filters. Instead, clean the surface carefully, place the mirror in your bathtub filled with tepid tap water, squirt a couple of drops of a, a mild, no, no perfumes, no dyes, dishwashing liquid like ivory soap, ivory liquid, let it soak, and then sweep the surface very gingerly with surgical cotton, not cotton balls. Cotton balls or processed cotton can be very sharp to the very delicate optical coatings on your mirror, and uh, you wouldn't want to scratch it. Finally, rinse everything off with, the distilled, with distilled water and set the mirror on an angle and let it air dry. I usually tilt it onto the pillows on my bed, putting a paper towel underneath so the bed spread doesn't get soaked, but it does work just fine. And that brings us to the final question. The question that whether it's your first telescope, your second telescope, your 20th telescope, which one is best for me? Should I get a refractor? Should I get a reflector? Should I get a catadioptric? Really only you know the answer to that question, and you may not know it at this point, and that's just fine. But what does that tell you you need to do? You need to do a couple of things. You need to first off become more familiar with the telescope market. You can do that in a number of different ways. Certainly coming to an event like this is ideal. I couldn't give you a better recommendation than to come to your local astronomy club's observing next observing session, such as we have here. Here you have a showroom, and you have experienced owners with telescopes who can tell you the good points and the bad points of their individual instruments. They know them better than the manufacturers know them because they have used them in the field. At the same time, do some reading. I do quite a bit of testing in astro for Astronomy Magazine. All of my tests are always very honest, and I give the Astronomy Magazine editors credit. They never edit anything bad I say about a telescope, even if it is one of the lead um, advertisers in the magazine. I've had some bad things to say about Celestron telescopes, and they have uh, printed those bad things about Celestron telescopes. So I give them that credit. Um, you can certainly email me. I'd be happy to, uh, to answer any questions as well, as, uh, as well via email. But I will give you a quote, how I end my book Starware, uh, with this final bit of advice. Be it, small, be it a small, inexpensive instrument or a pricey, advanced scientific device, the best telescope in the world is the one that you use often and enjoy. Because regardless of your budget, regardless of your aspirations, regardless of where you store the telescope, the best telescope is one that you as an individual enjoy and use often. That, to me, regardless of how much it costs, is the best telescope for you. Thank you very much. A couple of other shameless plugs real quickly before I take any questions you might have. If you'd like to talk about telescopes, I would certainly urge you to join a, uh, a discussion group I have on Yahoo, you know, on the Internet, of course. It's called Talking Telescopes, not because the telescopes talk, but we like to talk about them. Uh, we have something like 5,600 members around the world at this point. Uh, some amateurs who have been involved with astronomy for more years than I have. Others who have just gotten involved about 45 minutes ago. And uh, again, you can go to my website, which is simply philharrington.net, and you can get information and a link directly over to the Yahoo group uh, as well. Um, and again, my book, Starware, in third edition. I'm working on the fourth edition right now, which will be out in, in 2007. I would be very interested in hearing from you what you think about your telescopes, good, bad, or otherwise. And I have copies of that and Star Watch and Turing the Universe through binoculars. My first book, shamelessly on sale, at a discount, in the back of the table, uh, back of the temple. We can talk about that later on. 
Um, does anybody have any questions at all? While you think about your questions, let me encourage you to keep your seats when you're done. Mr. Harrington has donated some neat stuff, but you have to be here to get it. And hopefully you've been paying attention during his talk. Okay, uh oh, it could be there should be a could be a short quiz afterwards, I guess is what you're telling me, Rob. Yes. Huh. Sir. What has been your experience with uh, off-axis telescopes? Good question. What has been my experience with off-axis telescopes? By off-axis, for those who are unfamiliar with the term, um, these are reflecting telescopes that are based on the Newtonian design, but the mirror itself is actually only a, a segment of a mirror. The, uh, uh, the net result, without going through a lot of the optical details, the net result is instead of having a, a second small mirror in the optical path, it's a wide open view. And, and that is going to improve optical image and especially image quality uh, somewhat. Uh, my experiences have been very good, actually. Uh, I did a test for astronomy a few years ago of a uh, DGM. Okay, Dan McShane, uh, an amateur astronomer, professional optician up in Massachusetts, has a line of, of off-axis reflecting telescopes. They are rather pricey by some standards. Uh, I tested his uh, 3.6, which is the smallest instrument in his, in his uh, corral. And I found it to be very good optically. Mechanically, it was a little wobbly, okay, but optically, it was very, very good. I told him at the time, you know what you ought to do? You ought to take this telescope and do what Celestron and me do, pick up some, some uh, inexpensive equatorial mount from China and put it on there, and you'd have a real winner of an instrument. Lo and behold, what does Orion do about six months ago, or maybe not even three months ago? They introduced that very telescope. It was funny. He told me that um, after my review came out, two things happened. Uh, Number one, interest went through the roof. He couldn't keep up with the orders. But the second thing was, one of those orders was Orion telescopes. Okay? And that's kind of, kind of interesting. And what do we see, lo and behold, in their telescope? Uh, in their uh, catalog, rather, but their off-axis telescope. Interesting stuff. But they're, they're very good optically. Uh, I would say that um, uh, the little 3.6 inch certainly equaled the image uh, through a, uh, it was a better image quality than my 4 inch achromatic refractor. And I would say that, uh, by Vixen, and I would say it was, in terms of color, it was equal to that of any apochromatic refractor I've seen. Hmm. Okay. So very, very good. And they are, even though they're expensive, they're significantly cheaper than, a, than an apochromatic refractor. Any other questions, please? Yeah. What's my favorite kind of telescope to use? That's a loaded question. Um, my favorite, my personal one that I own, uh, the one that I use most often, is actually the telescope you saw in that observatory of mine over there. It's an 18-inch Newtonian reflector. And the only reason uh, I use it so often is now it's so convenient. If you've ever considered pondering an observatory and, and you say, well, you know, I don't know if I really want to build it. Is it worth the trouble? Yes, it is. Okay, that is the best accessory I've ever bought or made. It has increased my observing time tremendously. Uh, but my favorite are Newtonian reflectors in general. They, they give you the most bang for the buck. Uh, you can get the largest aperture, and I'm a deep sky guy, and, and so I want, you know, size counts. I want, I want big telescope, big aperture to gather more light. Absolutely. Any other questions, please? Yeah, I'm making a little um, outdoor observatory with a slide off roof, so it's basically a garden shed. It's not, it's not going to be moisture proof. So if you're keeping uh, something out there around the, you know, around the year, it's got electronics. Do you have to even keep it, worry about it? Keep, Covered. Co covered. Yes, you, you, you keep the entire instrument covered right. to prevent so rain or kind of whatever. Sure. The, the only thing I found with mine this, this winter, uh, and something I hadn't considered, uh, was that uh, uh, the mirror um, became uh, condensation on the, gathered on the mirror itself, even if I wasn't using the telescope. It was just sitting out there, right? I, I opened up the telescope one day, and all of a sudden, here's this rain cloud inside my, my instrument, and, and the mirror was just soaked. Uh, I found that I got rid of that by putting in a very simple 15 watt light bulb and keeping it on for about, about five, six hours a day. And I never had the problem again. So you want to do two things. You want to certainly ventilate. Ventilate, ventilate, ventilate. Um, I've put in a number of vents, all around passive vents. And I also put in a couple of solar powered, very, very small solar powered uh, uh, vent fans. Which, uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, I, I wasn't either. That's why I had to use the solar power and stuff. Um, I ended up for the for the 15 white uh, 15 watt um, light bulb. I just ran an extension cord, you know, and and, uh, and I kept funny. It was perpendicular to my path out to the observatory, so naturally every night, whoop, I trip over the thing. Uh, so that was pretty funny. And you think I know where it is by now? I still tripped over. I tripped over it just the other night. 
Um, but uh, now that it's getting warmer, I've taken it away and uh, condensation hasn't been a problem. But you do want to ventilate as best as you can. If the shed itself, the shed itself should certainly, you're picking up something from Home Depot or, or something along those lines? Okay. Um, the, it, you want to make it um, uh, as waterproof as you can and um, uh, the magic word there is caulk. Okay. I, I went through a lot of caulking and that seemed to uh, seal things up pretty nicely. Slides, what? It's not going to be tight. No, be, you, yeah. you want to, but you want to put a, um, um, some sort of a baffling. So in, in effect, if, if this is the, the roof here, you want to have the air so it goes around, up, and in like that. Okay. See what I'm saying? And, and rain's, air can do that, but rain's not going to be able to do that. So you want to, even, even if it's just a single sheet of plywood coming down, it doesn't matter as long as it prevents lateral motion of the rain. That, that would work fine. So I think that would work. You're welcome. Any other questions? Sir. Good question. The question is, uh, where could, where do you buy a telescope? Um, I can tell you where you don't buy a telescope. You don't buy a telescope at Walmart. You don't buy it at Kmart. You don't buy it at, at Target. Uh, you don't buy it from the Home Shopping Network. Uh, you don't buy it from you know, God. Don't buy it from eBay. Okay, eBay sells. Uh, you have these six-inch, really horrible telescopes for sale on eBay. They're, they're terrible. Um, I would certainly point you toward any of a number of different uh, uh, dealers that handle either Mead or Celestron. Orion Telescope Center is another reputable co company I'd point you to there over in California. Um, if you uh, go on the internet, I would go point you over to my website, join that group. And uh, we have links to a number of these different companies that you can certainly take a look at. In fact, if you go to my website, click on the Starware book cover, Look for the, the link that says on the next page up, that says chapter notes. I have what I call one of the appendices in the book is called the Astronomical Yellow Pages. And I have links to a dozen, if not hundreds, sorted by state um, telescope dealers. So I would look there. Okay. Any other questions, please? If not, Rob, you want to uh, okay, ask your questions? Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. In fact, this, uh, this has been really a neat night uh, for us, and the speakers have made it extra, extra special. Rod, you're over there. I don't know if you got your ten bucks, but let's uh, thank both our speakers for joining us and traveling so far. Bill has given us four Astronomy 2005 calendars annotated with astronomical events by Philip S. Harrington, so you know these are good. But you got to have paid attention. Okay. How many books is he the author of? I had a hand. Seven is the right answer. Which planetarium did he work for? Okay, let's go to the gentleman back here. Okay, that's correct. Hayden Planetarium. Not to be confused with Haydn which is uh, obviously a composer and what Rod does when his stories get back to his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, sorry. What's his daughter's name? Yes? Helen. Helen is correct, and I'm sorry, you had a right answer, Phil, but tough. Oh. Will. So the young lady right here. For those of you into radio astronomy, that did not come from outer space. And for the last one, who's better looking, Phil or Rod? Yes? That's a right answer. Good job, young man. Sorry, Rod.